Good morning, Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo, and the rest of the world. You've tuned in to the Max City Morning Show. I am your host, Elliot Pierre, and we're going to start the show off on the same note we start every show off, with a moment of gratitude. I know you could be doing a million other things with your time, and the fact that you're spending with us truly does mean the world to me, so thank you. On that note, Tanner, hit him with the intro. How she caught me, loves. You're listening to the Max City Morning Show. Okay, and we're back. All right, we have my favorite type of guest today, a complete stranger. Um, so, as you guys know at home, I do not introduce my guests because they can do that better than I can. So, on that note, can you please tell everybody at home who you are and what you're about? Good morning. My name is Naomi Smart. I'm a longtime resident in, of Fort McMurray. Um, until recently, I was employed with the oil sands in the area. Okay. Um, but today, I'm just here to talk about a few things and explore a few things and hopefully provide some knowledge to some people. Very cool. Thank you for reaching out. I do appreciate it. So one interesting thing that you got uh, started off was you said you are born and raised in Fort McMurray. No, born in Fort McMurray, but raised in Newfoundland. Sorry. That's right. Explain that one to me, please. Well, I guess my parents were here in the 70s and uh, they went back east and I did most of my secondary schooling there. I okay. graduated back east and then once I was finished up there I moved back to Fort Mac and kind of started my professional career. Okay so explain uh, Newfoundland. Where? What part of Newfoundland were you born in or raised in? Sorry. Um, just uh, outside of Gander. Just a, a little town outside of Gander. It's okay. about 2,100 people. It's called Glovertown. Okay. And there's quite a few people from my hometown that live in Fort McMurray. So no doubt. Yeah. So you went to, you grew up in Newfoundland, and then you finished all your schooling, and then you decided to move back to Fort McMurray. Yes. Was that because you um, had people here based on the career that you chose? You felt this was the right place? Like That's what, right. what brought you back originally? Well, a lot of my friends were already living up here. Um, there wasn't much work back east um, for young people. At that time, it was the 90s. Okay. And um, I decided to come up and kind of make a few inroads here and okay. did the normal start Started at waitressing and okay, I yeah I worked at uh, Diggers. Nice. Yeah, so I worked there in uh, 97, 98, 99. Okay, and uh, from there I made some more contacts and ended up um, you know working in construction and okay. onward to the oil sands in two thousand three four. Okay, and what um, kind of work were you doing in the oil sands? Just regular equipment operation, okay. all trucks. Dozers, graders, whatever. Yeah. Did you like working out that site? I do. do you? I did. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things I was fortunate enough, like born and raised here myself. Um, I was able to work out at Syncrude one summer and uh, it was punishment. Oh, <laughs> not something you uh, liked. No, like well, I've, what was taking place was I was in college and I wasn't really into it. And so my dad, like most of our parents at the time, was able to say like, hey, listen, as uh, an employee of this company, like our children can get like summer jobs um, for school. And I got you one. I said, okay. And I went out there and I'm convinced my dad, and when I say convinced, he's kind of told me he did this, but he got his buddies to give me the worst jobs ever. So I'm talking painting the coker uh, in the middle of the summer, like the paint would dry before it would even hit the, the top. I had to shovel coke dust under confined, uh, like under um, compressed air or whatever you call it, uh, man watch, spark watch, like you name it. Like it was brutal. So at the end of the summer, my dad is just like, did you like it out there? It's like, no. It's like, you're going to study hard in school? I said, yeah, I promise. So it's one of those things where being out at site for some people, they love it. And most of my friends, obviously, this community being born here, um, I'd say 98% of the people I know and hang out with work out at site. My hat goes off to them because it's not easy working out there. Like it's challenging mentally, physically. Like it's it's work. Mm-hmm. It's work out there. So, yeah. but you liked it when you were out there. I did. Yeah. Okay. Um, I started out with uh, with Shell. Okay. From 04 to 2012. Right. And then I took a little bit of a break. I took a couple of years off work in general and just stayed at home to raise my son. Okay. And um. Then when I got back into the industry, I worked uh, at a crane company, and after that, I decided I was ready to go back into the oil sands, and I went to work for another company, right? Um, which was strictly fly-in, fly-out. So oh, okay. 
I lived in camp for about five years on that site. Oh, wow. Mm. How did you like that? It's a very, it's, it's a challenge upon a, a challenge. Yeah, like no doubt. Aside from the tough working conditions and yeah. camp conditions are. Yeah. The, the camp condition itself was fine, but yeah. just adjusting to the whole work-life balance, I yeah, guess. Um, yeah, it's um, in a previous lifetime, a few years ago. Uh, I used to be in human resources, and I was um, the HR manager for a company called Acuron. And prior to that, I used to do recruiting for a company called um, EverReady. Mm -hmm. um, Clean Harbors? Clean Harbors. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I know a lot of, obviously, I've recruited lots of people to do fly-in, fly-out work. Um, maybe in camps that were something like the stationary camps or back in the day, rig camps. Um, yes, it's like you said, it's like a challenge upon a challenge. Some people like really can do it and other people can't. And like, it would, I remember I was in my early twenties when I, I stayed in a rig camp for the first time in the middle of the bush, like in the middle of the winter, or driving on an ice road and just like going out and thinking like, oh my gosh, like I just did it for a weekend just to see, right? Like I'm recruiting people. I got to say like, these are the conditions that you're going to be staying in. Well, you might as well stay in the in mm -hmm. the camp, and I was thinking, like, wow. Like, it was cool, but I didn't know. And it, like you said, like, the accommodations were great. I thought the food was phenomenal. Um, but the conditions are different, you know? So I was just like, I don't know. Like, I can do this for a weekend. I might even be able to do this for, like, a few months. I don't know if I can do this for the rest of my life. So five years, that's, that's a long haul. There are people on that former site that I was working on that have 15, 16 years of yeah. commuting and living in a camp setting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of the uh, recent U of A study that just came out. Um, Dr. Sarah Doro, I think her name was. I saw, I saw it pop up on my uh, Facebook feed, but no, I didn't click and go through it. Like I saw mm -hmm. the, the header in regards to like it adds to stress, but I never actually like clicked and read it. But w what was it about? Uh, well, I participated in it. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So, um, it was just exploring the, you know, the mental um, anguish sometimes that comes along with, you know, living in camp and detaching from your your real life right. into your work life. You're absolutely immersed in one versus immersed in another. That's and, right. Um, I think it takes a lot of um, commitment to keep yourself sane. I don't know if sane mm. is the right word, but um, to be able to leave one life and go into an and another That's right. and do it on a continual basis. 100%. 100%. Every 10, 15 days or whatever the schedule may be. That's right. Um, and these men, mostly men yeah. that have been doing it, I mean, they, they come up to these camps and they, they give their all for two weeks at a time and then they mm. go home and they have to, you know, come out of their work mode get into their husband and father mode and, and right. a lot of times this transit transition like isn't easy for people no no know? it's not i found it was always um an ongoing issue with uh staff that i had that commuted mm -hmm. in regards to, like i i would certain roles for sure you would say like you you have no choice but to commute like turn around shutdowns some of the like very far northern sites that like are here in fort mac um, but I, I used to tell, especially like the younger guys with their family, I'm like, what's going to happen is like, you're going to come up here and you're going to work and then you're going to go back home and you're going to be tired because you work hard. Like you've been gone for a week or two or a month or whatever. Like your significant other has like a honeydew list for you when you get home and you got to do it because they've been waiting on you. And like, that's a hard transition to make when you come home and you're tired on those first few days and he or she is just like, hey, honey, you're mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm happy to see you, but I also have all this stuff I need you to do. And then you're just like, listen, I just, I just work like a dog. Like I need some time. And I'm like, it's gonna cause tension unless you like communicate really well. And, and you understand that. So like, I have no doubt that the study is, is bang on. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it is an additional stress that somebody who does like live and work in the same mm -hmm. town or place that's a hurdle that most don't have to, to overcome, right? Well, I always say that um, people that don't work shift work or camp life or exposed to that kind of industry that requires that, people that don't work actually in it yeah. will never oh, no. understand it. Never. Never understand never. the pressures. No. no. Well, myself and Tanner talk about it in regards to like growing up here when both of our fathers worked out at site, and they work shift work. Mm -hmm. And so when you're a young child you're in bed before your dad gets home and he's gone before you wake up. So mm -hmm. f 
for those durations of time, like my dad worked a five on four off, four on five off. Mm -hmm. Like for those shifts, he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Like you heard maybe if you stayed up late enough to see him for a second or hear his voice, but for that shift work, he he just doesn't exist from a younger age. Which like when I moved away from Fort McMurray to go to school, and you would tell people that they'd be like, "What are you talking about?" Like I guess my dad goes on business trips or something sometimes, but like not on a very like regular occurrence right it's it's different and unless you live it you don't know you don't know it yeah, i'm the so same foreign. my son was the same as you like he wouldn't see me for my night shifts yeah because you work you work your night yeah you come home and you go to bed and you get up and you have your half an hour to get yourself going that's right and you can high five your toddler or your kid out through the door and that's yeah, it that's see it you for five ten minutes a day yeah for those night shifts yeah and, and it takes a toll on families it does mm -hmm. especially I, I just met a woman a few weeks ago actually i forget her name and i do apologize i kind of remember her name and i kind of remember her company but like i don't want to say it because i'll probably get it wrong um but uh she's in the healthcare or um child care industry and she was really fighting and she won and she's opening and has a bigger version of what she's already started, but uh, childcare for site families, because like you're to drop your kid off at f six and pick them up at six doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Doesn't exist, especially like for night shifts. So mm -hmm. like, what do you do? Or just regular shift. You don't get home until nine. So it was something where like, I have a young, young child and I'm lucky enough that, uh, created a, a circumstance where I can pick them up and drop them off but and I'm also blessed that uh my family my mom and dad decided to retire in Fort McMurray so I've got the grandparents to help me out but there's a lot of people who are definitely not in that situation so it's tough it is it's very tough. yeah so now you were initially uh messaged me to come and talk about um something that I know nothing about so I'm interested to hear what you got to say about the topic but it was about CNRL and a petition regarding something about vaccinations. Now, once again, I'm being 100% honest. Uh, I do zero preparation for the show, so and I don't work at CNRL, obviously. So I have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm very interested to hear kind of like what, what it's about and what you wanted to, to speak about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no um, problem. About a year ago, I went to work for CNRL. Um, Doing the same job that I've done, well, 20 years. Right. Um, and uh, they've been following closely along with all the government implemented rules and such, you know, because they do have a, a fly in, fly out situation. They have town people coming and going, and right. they want to keep their work workforce safe and healthy. And so they followed along quite stringently with all the restrictions that have come. Right. Um, and. But they've been the first and only oil sands company, as far as I'm aware, to implement a mandatory vaccination policy. Oh, okay. And they came out with that policy on, I think it was September 23rd. Okay. Uh, of this year. Oh, so quite early. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So um, in order to be compliant for the December 1st, Deadline, mm -hmm. you have to be fully vaccinated by December 1st, meaning having your two shots right. by the middle of November to be qualified to be vaccinated. I guess you're not double vaxxed until your two weeks have passed, past your second shot. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. But um, I had been closely consulting with my doctor um, yeah. ever since this whole thing came in. I had COVID in uh, 2020. Okay. Uh, Went through it, recovered. Um, Happy to hear that. Thank you. Um, I wasn't too sick, but I'm a young, relatively healthy person, non-smoker, no co-morbidities, uh, I yeah. guess, of what, whatever they call it there, no no uh, health issues. Right. Um, so I recovered um, in 2020, and I'd been, like I said, in touch with my doctor quite regularly. Mm -hmm. And then when CNRL brought in their policy, I w oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. But in August, I'd gone to see him because we saw how the climate was changing when it comes to, you know, points of view on the whole vaccination deal and what, That's right. what people are doing and what companies are doing and how people are reacting. And yeah. So I went to him in August and I said, I don't know what's going to happen. He said, well, we've talked about it at great length and we've decided that you're not really a good candidate for 
oh. vaccination because okay. of my health history. I have documented history of being hospitalized for anaphylaxis. Okay. Are you familiar with that? Not a clue. Okay, so anaphylaxis is a condition where uh, your throat and airways close off involuntarily due to a reaction from unknown and unknown drugs, situations, dusts, whatever. That's right. It's an allergic reaction. Yeah, yeah. So I'd experienced this about three times in the last 10 years. I was hospitalized for it. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, at this time, we don't know what what could happen with you. I recommend that you don't go ahead with your with the vaccination. I right. said, I'm, I'm well aware and I'm happy about that and I'm good. I'm, I'm COVID recovered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had my antibody test done in August of this year. I'm still showing immune right, to the right. virus. Yeah, yeah. So he had offered at that time in August to write me an exemption. If you, whatever you need, he said, I will write it for you. Oh, and fantastic. Yeah, and at that time I went, nah. Yeah, I'm no. okay. <laughs> I, I won't need that. I'm, I'm good. Right. Oh, no. Fast forward a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my company comes out with the mandatory right. rule. Yeah, yeah. So I went back to him, and I texted him because he's an ultra cool guy, and he gave me his phone number should I ever need it. So yeah. I texted him, and I said, hey, about that exemption you offered mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. write for me. He said, yeah, about that. He said... We have been given strict instructions by the CPSA. Do you know what that is? Uh -uh. Physicians Governing and Surgeons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Canadian Physicians and Surgeons Association. Yeah. To uh, not write exemptions right. for any reason. And any exemptions up till this point that have been written, we are instructed to redact. Oh, no. So I'm like, what? Yeah. How is that even possible? And my company had stated in their their memo that they would accept religious and medical exemptions. That's right. So here I am with a medical condition. Yeah. My doctor is not allowed to write me a medical exemption. Right. I have a deadline to be double jabbed by November 15th. Yeah. Or I'm out of a job. That's right. So I kind of went into overdrive and I was like, what am I going to do? I love my job. Mm -hmm. I love people I work with I don't have any issue um I was hoping to move ahead in the company I'd only been with them less than a year but right. I was on the road to you know progressing yeah. and yeah, yeah. becoming part of a leadership team as far as I knew and yeah. you know, working towards those things so my mind went into overdrive like what am I going to do so I said you know maybe I maybe I should check with a lawyer and I didn't want to leave it up to anyone right anyone else right to, to do this for me yeah and i'd had contacts on site of people who were like freaking out like i was like because they yeah. they for one reason or another their mm. personal decision they didn't want to be a part of a mandated needle whatever and yeah. i didn't want to leave my own situation up to someone else to take care of so right. i got in touch with a few of these people those names were given to me and i said okay we need to work together yeah um I think I can find us a lawyer. Right. And I did. Okay. And I organized a lawyer. Yeah. And I wanted to help people that were on the same wavelength. And I mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to help. Yeah. And I came up with quite a few names in the original, like, week that we'd put started. the information out there. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. Got, we got a couple hundred names. And yeah. I organized a Zoom meeting for everybody. Okay. With this lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Who... We didn't have any plans of litigation or lawsuits or anything. It was just purely to be made aware of our rights as workers and to receive some sort of comfort that we weren't going to be left out in the cold or, or that we had some sort of leg to stand on mm -hmm. with not having to do this to keep our job. Right. So we had about a 100 people on that call. I'm not sure... When there's 100 people on a Zoom call, how do you filter out who's there and who's yeah. not for That's right. genuine reasons? That's right. But whatever. I mean, I'm a trusting person. I'm an honest person. And if I can help, I'm going to help. Mm -hmm. So we had the initial meeting. And then from there, um, I got added to a Telegram group. Um, 
And the in the tel I wasn't aware of how Telegram worked, but most people don't use their real names on Telegram. Okay. Most people use aliases or whatever other handles and Okay. In the first little while I was using my own name. So yeah. that was attached also to perhaps some things that were happening within that group. Yeah. Things that I necessarily wasn't a part of. Right. But my name was attached to the Zoom meeting and it was yeah, attached yeah. to the because the guy that ran the Telegram immediately added me as an admin to the Telegram group. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure how my name was associated with all kinds of things happening, but I kind of stepped, after the Zoom meeting, mm. I stepped away and yeah. let a few other people kind of just take yeah. the reins That's for right. whatever was happening in the, in the Telegram group. Yeah. Um, because I'm very, very technologically inept. Okay. Um, I can manage to copy and paste. I can manage to do one or two emails. Right. I can copy and paste into an Excel yeah. document. Other than that, that's about where, where it ends. Where <laughs> it ends, yeah. <laughs> so um, we had a couple other people that were very, very uh, well versed in the in the data collection and yep. you know data um, tally and stuff like that and. So they took over the um, the taking of names and the things like that of people who wanted to sign up with our cause. Right. I had nothing to do with any of that. Yeah, yeah. I just, I was done, right? So um, that group had uh, come up with, a, I guess, an action plan. Okay. And in the action plan, um, they had come up with um, a three-day sick out. Okay. Now... I didn't say whether I was or wasn't for it. I just planned on not going into work, and I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, what's the word, advertised it from my own lips to people. I was yeah. like, whatever, I was going to participate, but I wasn't just, you know, coming out and saying, you need to do this and you need to do that. And mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that. Um, and that was like October... 23rd, 24th, maybe, when the action plan for the group had come out. Right. We need to send CNRL a message that this is this is wrong. This okay. is not what we want. Right. And uh, I'm not sure what happened, but October 26th, I got a phone call from my manager, um, and he told me that as of October 26th, I was no longer employed with CNRL. Okay. And he, that was it. There was no explanation. I was being dismissed without cause. Thank you. Have a good day. Right. And he was done. Yeah. And I'm th like, that was a week ago, tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, i just been, I, I don't know, I haven't been able to really get wrap my head around what's taken place because right. it, you can ask anyone who's ever known me or worked with me that yep. I've never had ill intentions toward anyone or anything. Right. I just like doing the right thing. Right. And I don't think that the right thing is allowing a company to inoculate me to yeah. keep me employed. Right. Or to keep you employed. Mm -hmm. And if that's your choice, you want to do that, that's, that's right. your choice. That's right. I'm not anti-whatever. I am pro-choice. Mm -hmm. So after, after the phone call where he let me go, I was just dumbfounded really because yeah, no doubt. without cause I looked it up and it was free of any professional misconduct so they didn't say I wasn't doing my job I've always done my job like mm -hmm. I said the week before that I'd been approached by the leadership team asking me to train to mm -hmm. fill in for leadership right a week before yeah so in the matter of a week I was no longer part of the company and I'm I just thought I'd like to come and tell my story yeah, and, for sure. and, uh, and just let everyone know that my intentions were purely, purely genuine. Yeah. I just wanted to help the people that don't want to do this to keep their job. That's right. <coughs> yeah. Um, so this is where I'm at. I'm unemployed. Um, first time in my life I've ever been uh, let go from anything. Mm. Um, I don't really have a plan. Yeah. I don't know what's happening even tomorrow. Right. But um, I've made some inroads with some people who are 
um, championing the cause from my side of it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've heard about uh, Chris Scott with the Whistle Stop Cafe. No. Um, he's been quite a voice for the um, Alberta Small Business and uh, AHS has shut him down multiple times in mm-hmm. 2020, 21. Okay. Uh, for violating their uh, restrictions or whatever it is they want to call it. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm also <coughs> in touch with some uh, doctors associated with Mr. Uh, Scott, right. uh, Dr. Nagasi. Okay. He's a doctor out of Rimby who um, was fired after he treated his patients in the Rimby Hospital with ivermectin. Okay. And he was fired for doing that. He cured them all. And uh, so he's part of the group. I, I'm hoping to meet up with them in the near future. Okay. Um, Dr. Modry, Dr. Hodkinson, these were all the names that everyone needs to become aware with. Okay. Aware of, sorry. Yeah. Um, like I said, I've never been anti. Right. Never. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like you are currently. No. Yeah. I don't care how many things you want to take. I just don't want it forced on me to be able to work. That's right. And I've been open and honest from from the get go. I've never had a malicious intent from yeah. the get go. Um, I think I've been um, plucked out of a group to kind of send a message to others that this is what happens if you mm-hmm. go against what what the big CNRL is trying right. to trying yeah. to do here. So I, I, I don't not alone. There you go. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming in being so open and honest with your candor today about what's going on with you. So that's been really nice. And I'm hoping that I, you were telling me that you were able to get on some other platforms to tell your story as well. That's so right. The Western Standard go. picked up my story, yeah. as did Rebel News. There you so go. Um, I guess I think I'm falling under the uh, their Stop the, Mac, uh, the Vaccine Mandate um, umbrella there. They have a few different okay. items that you can contribute to, but you can go on to rebelnews.com and uh, have a look at my story there or the Western Standard online and cool. have a look there. Well, listen, I hate to cut you short, no but the show's only 20 minutes long. So I do want to thank you for coming and t- telling your story. Um, if you ever want to come back on the show again, by all means, that seat is always open for you. The show is structured in a sense where it's only 20 minutes long because nobody is only 20 minutes of being interesting. So you can come back again and again and again. So please take me up on the offer. If you're ever back in Fort McMurray, come hang out with myself and Tanner. I will. All Thank right. you so much. Now, at the end of the show, though, everybody gets a sh- uh, shameless shout out or plug. So the camera's on you. The mic's on you. Have fun. A shameless plug. Or shout out. Oh, my goodness. Yep. To one of my girls in Fort Mac that I've always kept in touch with, um, Aliyah. She's a local realtor, so... She's always had my back. If I ever need anything, I, I get in touch with her. So There thanks. we go. Awesome shout out. Okay, well, Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo, and the rest of the world, thank you very much for tuning into the Max City Morning Show. Um, once again, it means the world to me, so thank you. Uh, hopefully you're having a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Peace.